Okay, good morning. It's good to be in God's house today, man. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, take them out. We're going to be back in Matthew chapter 7, and if you want to bookmark that place, we're going to be there for the next few weeks still yet as we continue on in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, today we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 12 of Matthew chapter 7. And um, today's scripture is something that uh, actually is, is uh, it's, it was a revelation to me as I studied this. Last week, uh, Brother Mike, he uh, preached verses 1 through 5. And as he preached those, um, God spoke to me a lot. And I, I believe if you were here last week, I'm sure the Lord gave you some things. And, and, and I wonder how many of you put those into practice about judging and about uh, the plank and the speck and all those things. I mean, just so many things there. And as I was studying to continue on in this text in, in verse uh, 7, uh, and actually, don't be worried. I, uh, he, he preached 1 through 5, and, and verse 6 is going to come into play. I, have you ever had a scripture that it, you can take scripture and you can make it say a lot of things that it shouldn't say? And you can take Scripture and take it out of context and, and make it fit the way you want it to fit with your life or with, with circumstance or things. And, and what I found with Scripture is you have, to, you have to keep Scripture in context. I think a lot of times, sometimes we like to take Scripture and we just like to throw it out there and, and grab a hold of it and, and, and really not look at the context of where it's coming from. Remember when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he was on a hillside, and, and I had the fortune last January, Lisa and I, to travel to, to Israel and, and to be in the very place where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, and just uh, thinking about what he, he was setting on this hillside and, and uh, how there was hundreds of people that had gathered, maybe even a few thousand was gathered, and he was teaching his disciples through this message, but there was thousands or hundreds of people that were hearing what was being said, and, and there was a flow, just like I hope that when I preach to you, I hope there's a flow to it. I hope it's not just picking and potting and whatever I want to. It's, it's more like a river um, that, than, a, than a puddle. Uh, the Mississippi River, it flows, right? I mean, you can't, uh, you can't just jump in and not realize that it's a whole river flowing and, and realize that, that, that it's a lot bigger picture. Uh, a puddle, you can get in trouble because you can make a mud puddle say, uh, do anything you want it to, Right? And you can just jump in, and, and, and there's no context to it. So that's, I'm trying to set this up in a way that, that you realize that I began to see this, this whole rest of the Sermon on the Mount in a way that I hadn't really seen before. And sometimes you can just take and pull things out. And, 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 and how in the world does uh, Mike talking about judging last week? He was talking about judging. And, and how, how does judging fit in with asking and seeking and knocking? And so that's what I was trying to do, and that's what I'm going to try to do today, is make it fit in together, because you can preach all these messages, and, and, but there's a flow here, is what I'm trying to say. It, it's like, you know, when, when we try to, just out of the blue, so you can't take Scripture and just take it and make it say anything. It's, it's kind of like um, taking things out of context this way. Last weekend, we had uh, our grandsons, two of them stay all night, and it's becoming a habit, a good habit, I like that. But uh, Emmett and Easton were at the house. Actually, it was two weeks ago when all four of them were there, all the, the four boys. And we were planning this surprise for them, and we were going to uh, take them. It was on Sunday, and we were going to take them on Monday to the YMCA over in Louisiana. They got a swimming pool. We was going to let them swim. And so that was, that was a surprise. We let them know. And, and then Lisa said, and we even got a, another surprise for you, too. And it was all tied to the swimming. Well, what it was is Megan was going to bring Cutter over, and Cutter was going to get to swim with them. So Lisa's talking to him, and the boy said, and we got another surprise for you. And out of the blue, Emmett looks at her, he goes, is it a monkey? <laughs> Where'd that come from? I have no idea. That's pretty awesome. Emmett's thinking, hey, a surprise, we're going to get a monkey. I'm like, where did that come from? But that's almost like it is, you know, when you're talking about one thing and it's flowing, like going to the Y and all these surprises and, and taking Scripture out of context and trying to get a monkey out of that somehow, right? And so, in, in the context of what I was looking at this go-round, about judging and then asking and seeking and knocking, how does that all flow together? Jesus was preaching a message, not stopping you know, a week in between and then starting again. He was preaching something that flowed. 
And, and so for the first time, I began to look at it as, as a river, not a puddle. And, and as I did that, I, 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 was, I was trying to figure out how this fit together, and then it hit me. As we bring our request to God, and that's asking, seeking, and knocking, we come to God. How, how many of you are asking or seeking or knocking something from God right now? Raise your hand if you are. Probably all of us are, right? There's something we're asking. There's something we're seeking. There, there's a door we're knocking on from God, trying to figure something out or trying to ask God to do something or help us or whatever it may be. And, and, and how does that flow with judging? And, and, and so here, here's the conclusion that I came to, to. As we bring our request to God, we must judge whether or not we are ready to receive the answer from God. It, it, when we re bring requests to God, we need to judge ourselves Am I ready to receive an answer from God? You know, there's probably answers that you're waiting for right now. There's probably some things that you're trying to figure out and you're knocking on the door. Or you're, you're trying to see if God's in it or trying to get something that you need from, not get, but I mean just asking something of God or seeking an answer. And, and so that was my conclusion. So today, here's what I want to do. I want to take this scripture in context and, 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 and see how it flows and try to give us some helpful insights and maybe some diagnostic questions that we can ask ourselves as we ask, as we seek, as we knock, and try to help us to get an answer from God or to see something within us that we didn't see before. Because, you know, God always answers our prayers, but sometimes we may not be ready to receive that answer. And so let's stand, and we're going to read this together in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, if, he, if his son asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who are asking him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning humbly asking for your, your presence and your power to move here today. Not just among us, but within us, God. Father, we know that you are Heavenly Father and you love us more than we will ever understand. Father, that you are answering and you're doing in our lives things that we, we can't even see or, or begin to comprehend, Lord. Lord, your word says that you do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. That you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Father, I pray today as we begin to dive into your word. We've read your word and I stand upon your word today, God. Not my thoughts, but your word. Jesus' words. I pray, God, that you would help us to understand what you're speaking to us today, God. Father, as always, if someone here today needs Christ in their life, I pray today would be the day that you would penetrate their hearts and, and speak the gospel message to them in a way that, that would make sense to them and they would just give their life to you today, Lord. Lord, I pray for us as believers here today as we gather in your house and in your name that, God, you would speak a holy word to us, pure and undefiled, Lord, that we would receive it in such a way that we would be changed when we leave this place. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning as we look at the text that, that we're approaching here today, I, I want to answer and try to look at three things we must all judge within ourselves as we are asking and seeking and knocking. We, we've already established that you're, you're probably asking of God and you're seeking and, and you're knocking on, on, on heaven's door for some reason, for something. And, and so what I want to do is look at three things we should all judge, thinking of judgment, judging, we don't have time to be judging others. We need to first judge ourselves. That's what the Bible says. And, and, and what we should judge within ourselves. And the first thing is this. 
We must judge whether or not we are seeing clearly. Simple as that. We must judge whether or not we're actually seeing clearly when it comes to asking and seeking and knocking. Now, so most of you can relate to this in some way or another, but uh, a few years ago, several years ago now, whenever, um, whenever I started to, to age, uh, I began to notice something. Actually, some people noticed something in me before I did. Uh, Eric, at the time, was about 10 years old, and I took him out deer hunting and was out in the woods, and, and he got excited, and he said, Dad, there's deer up on the, on the ridge there. Can you see them? And I'm, I'm looking at him like, I can't see the top of the ridge hardly, let alone the deer. But he saw them clearly. He could see them. I, could, I couldn't see them. I could see a speck, but I couldn't tell what it was. And, and I was like, son, I can't see that. And he goes, they're right there. And I'm like, I know, but I can't see them. And I began to think, why am I not seeing that? And then we would come to church. And, and how many of you remember the old church building? It's still, you can go back to the old church. Some of you can, some of you can't. And, and it wasn't quite as big as this by any means. And, and we'd be sitting there in church. And, and I wasn't pastoring at the time. Uh, I was sitting in the church, and I'd be sitting beside Lisa. And you remember the scoreboard that was up in the right-hand corner uh, that told, and it's in the office now, it told how much, how, many, how much offering there was, how much attendance was last week, and all that stuff, you know, and it was in the corner. And it probably wasn't from, you know, probably me to Doug away. And I'd tell Lisa, I said, what, what's that number up there on that board? And, and how much was the offering last week and things like that? And she goes, you can't see that? And I'm like, no, I can't. And she goes, we're going to take you, and you're going to get your vision checked. And I'm like, I don't need glasses. I don't want glasses. I want nothing to do with them. And she goes, you're going. So we went to Quincy to, to eye doctor. And I go in there, and I've told this story a long time ago, but it, some of you guys may remember. But we went in there, and the, the nurse is waiting on me and all that, or the, the, the lady that's, that's the, helping the, the eye doctor. I don't know what you call that, but she, she was helping him. And... Um, she, she started doing some things and all, and she said, she said to me this. She said, uh, what is your prescription now? And I said, I don't wear glasses. And she looked at me, Phil, and she goes, did you drive up here today? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I drove up here. And it's like, you know, she's like, where's your cane, you know, or something like that, you know. And I'm like, you know what? I've been lying to myself a long time, Phil. I couldn't see. And now you guys are thinking, well, you don't wear glasses. I wear contacts. I've worn them for years. I wore glasses for a while, and, and it got in the way of my duck hunting, Jim Bob. You'd jump up out of the duck hole, and your glasses would fog over, and you couldn't see. So I was like, I'm wearing contacts. I can't have this. So I had to come to the conclusion that I wasn't seeing clearly. I was fooling myself. I was lying to myself. I was not honest with myself. I was not seeing the way that I should. And that's exactly what happens when we pray to God. Sometimes we don't see and we don't realize it. We can fool ourselves into thinking that I'm seeing clearly. I'm, I'm in church every Sunday. I'm doing things, you know, for the Lord. But here's what I came to the conclusion. Our, our vision, our spiritual vision can become impaired and we cannot even realize it. While our vision is impaired, now listen to this. If you don't write anything else down on this one, listen to this. While our vision is impaired, our judgment will be impaired also. You cannot make a clear judgment if you can't see. Whenever I was wearing those glasses that I got, I hated wearing those glasses. I just, I don't know, something about it, I hated wearing them. I don't mind wearing sunglasses. I think it was just the idea of it. And I, we was getting ready to pull up to the four-way downtown here, and I left my glasses at home. I told Lisa, I said, I don't need those glasses. I'm not wearing those glasses. And I pulled up to the four-way, and I took off, and I pulled right out in front of another car. She goes, you're going home getting those glasses. You can lie to yourself as long as you want, but you're not going to see clearly. It can be very dangerous if you're not seeing as you're asking, seeking, and knocking. In fact, Mike preached last Sunday about how... How can, you, how can you judge somebody else with a speck in their eye whenever you you got a plank in your own? It's, it's kind of like, and, and what I was thinking, when I was, thought I was going to preach that message was this. You may have a speck in your eye the same as your brother, but when it's in your eye, it's so much closer, it's like a plank. In other words, don't try to help someone else. You may think your sin is small, but it's big because it's close. It's you. And, and, and how dare you try to judge someone else when you're not willing to deal with things in your own life? 
Now, we need to be helping our brothers, and we need to be able to help not judge them, but at least look at their lives. And we're going to look at that here down the road about the fruit inspecting. You know, that's going to come up here, and, and it all ties to judging. So, this is where that comes in. But, but here's where verse 6 comes in. Now, Mike didn't preach it, and I'm not preaching it, but I'm going to put it in here, okay? Because it all flows. You can't jump from a speck and a plank to asking and seeking and knocking. Look at verse 6 with me. He says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they, they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. I could, I could preach a whole message on that. But here's what I want to get out of that so it flows. Now, in Jesus' day, they had to worry about false prophets uh, uh, leading them astray. They had to worry about the Jewish leaders that were leading the, the nation of Israel not to God, but away from God into religion and not a relationship with God. And, and so there were, there were two things in that day that we need to understand. Dogs were not domesticated. They, they just weren't domesticated. They didn't bring them in the house and, and have them for pets, you know, and things like that. Dogs were more wild. And, and, and a wild dog is, is dangerous. And, and a wild dog, in fact, uh, there was a video that Lisa showed me that of, of, a, of a wild dog that came and there was a little girl getting out of a bus on a church parking lot and her mom was there and the dog comes out of nowhere and grabs a hold of the girl's arm and they had to, they had to get that dog off that girl because he was trying to kill her. Little girl. I think that's what Jesus has got in mind, a wild dog. And, and pig, swine, you know, it, it, to a Jewish person, a swine was the most unclean animal. They wouldn't touch them. They don't eat them. They don't have anything to do with them because they were unclean, unholy, and, and, and they were dangerous too because they were like wild hogs too. They just were in the wild. And has anybody ever seen a wild boar? Actually, a wild boar, they're dangerous. And, and so you don't take what is good and try to give to something that is bad. You don't take what's in your life that is good and try to give to someone who's going to hurt you or harm you. You're supposed to love everybody, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to get close enough for them to hurt you, if that's their intention. So, to tie together, if you're not seeing clearly, you, you can't judge whether someone is a good person or a bad person, whether someone is evil or, or, or holy. You, can't, you, you shouldn't be trying to, 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 to pray for someone without clearly seeing where they are in their life. And, and so that's how that, I, I believe that ties together. So that's a danger. So we must judge whether or not we can see clearly. Those are danger signs. If you're judging others and you're not looking at your own self and you're, you're, you're not able to discern whether somebody's right or wrong or, or, or you're dangerous or not, and, and, and that's how you get mixed up with the wrong people and the wrong crowd, do you ever tell your kids, you don't see what I see. They're not good people. You need to stay away from those kind of people, right? And your kids can't see that because they're not looking clearly. And that's the same thing when it comes to our Christian walk. We must judge whether or not we're seeing clearly as we're asking and seeking and knocking. Why? You could be asking and seeking and knocking for the wrong thing and be in danger. Next thing. We must judge whether or not we are living consistently. Next thing you need to do is make sure that as you're asking and seeking and knocking, that you're, you're living consistently. Now, there's no doubt that right now you're asking and you're seeking and you're knocking for something. We've already established that. You're doing that consistently and you're doing it persistently. Now, now some of you think that it's wrong to ask of God over and over and over. I don't think that's true in the right context. That God wants us to be persistent in our prayers. God wants us to be consistent in our prayers and persistent in our prayers. But here's the problem. <laughs> In verse 7, it says to keep on asking, keep on knocking, and keep on, on or keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. That's, that's the way that verbiage is in, in, the, in the Hebrew text. It's to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on. So it's okay to keep asking God in that context. And, and so as we do that, we're consistently and persistently asking and seeking and knocking, but are we consistently and persistently living out a Christian walk? You understand what I'm saying? If you do, say amen. We need to be sure that we're living out the Christian walk. If we're going to pray to God, we need to be sure we're right with God. We need to be sure that we're not just pot shot in here. We need to be sure that we're not living our lives all over the place like like. Like, like a roller coaster. How many of you like roller coasters? 
Okay, some of you do. How many of you hate roller coasters? Okay, more of you hate them than like them, right? I found that as my eyesight went, I got older and I hated roller coasters. I loved them when I was a kid. I, I loved to ride them. In fact, I can remember going to different amusement parks and, and riding a roller coaster and I couldn't wait to get there to ride them. And, and, and the greatest thing, if you love roller coasters, is this. When you get to the theme park, wherever it's at, and you get on the roller coaster and you ride it and you pull in and the guy says, there's nobody in line, do you want to ride again? That's fun, isn't it? Make, yeah, Megan make, make can connect with that. You go again. So you go again. And then you come around and you're thinking, oh man, I hope I can do this again. And you do it. And he says, hey, there's still nobody in line. Go again. And you just keep doing that. Now, some of you enjoy roller coasters. Some of you don't. Sometimes our life is like a roller coaster. You, you get on and, and you start the day. And you go out. And you're just having a good time. You're, you're, it's like your day you're at an amusement park, right? You're just having a great day. And then all of a sudden, it seems like you're kind of having to climb this hill and you're having to go about your day. And the next thing you know, the bottom falls out and you just take off and you don't know where you're headed. You're upside down, around, backwards. And before you know it, the day is gone and you're like, man, that was a crazy day. Anybody ever have a crazy day? Yeah. There's something different between your life and a roller coaster. At the end of the day, and you realize all the things that have happened, and sometimes it's because of your own fault. You're the one that climbed on the roller coaster. You just do it all over again. You know, it's time, there's some times that we need to get off the roller coaster. What do I mean by that? There's times that when my life is such a mess and I'm just all over the place and I'm not living consistently and persistently where God wants me to be and I'm not doing my best to put on the full armor every day and I keep going the same path and staying on that same roller coaster ride, there comes a point where we have to wake up to our senses and say, let's get off this ride. You know the uh, story of the... Um... Oh, shoot, I just lost it. Forgetfulness comes with old age, too. Yes. Um, oh, my gosh. The prodigal son. Man, I couldn't think of that. The prodigal son. The prodigal son went out, and, and he wasn't with the father where the father wanted him to be, and he was out, and he was having a good time, and all of a sudden, the drop, bottom dropped out of it, and his life was on a roller coaster. I mean, he was a mess. Where did he end up with? He ended up feeding pigs, a Jewish boy feeding pigs, and... And finally, he was so hungry that he just wanted to eat the pods of the pig that the pigs ate. Now, you can't understand that as an American person. We can't. But that was as low as it ever got. Anybody ever been to the bottom of the barrel? Have you ever got to the bottom of the barrel in your life? You, you, know, what, you know what you have to do when you get there? The same thing that boy did. It says that he woke up and he come to his senses. Sometimes we're there for a long time. Sometimes we're there for a short time. You know the good thing about being at the bottom of the barrel? Is there's no way but up from there. That God can take that time. And you know what that boy did? He came to his senses and he said, If I could just go back to my father, and if I could just live in his house as a servant, and eat the crumbs that fall from his table, I would be happy. He wasn't there a few years ago whenever he was a spoiled brat. He said, Dad... You're not dead yet, but go ahead and give me your inheritance so I can go out and live the way I want to and have a great time and hop on this roller coaster. Finally, he decided it's time to get off. And maybe that's where you're at in your life. There's things in your life you know that's not consistent with God's Word. There's things that you know that you're not persistent with in the Lord. There's things that are going on right now that you know your actions are speaking volumes about your prayer life and what you're asking of God. The truth is, if our lives were as consistent and persistent as the prayers and petitions that, that we ask of God, our lives would be a much better place. I've got some scriptures I want you to write down. I don't have time to do these, but this, this goes along with this. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 23. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 23. It talks about obeying God's commands and loving God and things like that and, and why we're not getting prayers answered because of that. Another one is James 5.17. Danita, we, we had a whole study on that about, the, help me with this, the prayer of a 
The fervent prayer, the, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know what that means? If your prayer is not effective, if your prayers are not fervent, if you're not living righteously, then you shouldn't expect God to answer your prayers, really. You know, prayer is more about you getting to where God wants you to be than you getting God to be where you want Him to be. You got it? Prayer's not changing God's mind. God already has his mind made up. He already wants to bless you. He already wants to help you. He already wants to, to, to make you more like Christ. It's him getting you to that point. And if you're not living consistently, you cannot be where God wants you to be. And maybe that's why your prayers are not being answered. Last thing I want you to hear today. First thing, we must judge whether or not we're seeing clearly. Are you really seeing clearly today spiritually? Second thing, we must judge whether or not we are living consistently. Is there something in your life where you're not living consistent? And then finally, we must judge whether or not we are thinking correctly. Are we thinking correctly? You know, I, I, I think it's interesting, and here again with the flow, I start seeing all these things come to life. Even back in Matthew chapter 6, I'm thinking, there, it clicks, it, it fits in. It's, it's, it's not looking for a monkey, it's looking for a flow. In verse 22 of chapter 6, Jesus says, The lamp of the body is the eye. And therefore, your, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore, if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? It's about seeing, living, and thinking. It all goes together. And if, if, if the right stuff is going in, the right thoughts are going to come out. And if the wrong stuff is going in, the wrong thoughts are going to come out. You, how many of you ever heard the saying, garbage in, garbage out? There's so much truth to that. Yet we watch garbage on TV, don't we? We look at garbage on the internet. We let people who want to put garbage into our life just keep filling us full of it. And then we wonder why we can't see from God. The third thing that I want us to understand is we must judge whether or not we are thinking correctly. Let me ask you this. Is God good? Is God good? How often is God good? All the time. All the time. Amen. Do you really believe that? Sometimes it's hard to believe that, isn't it? Sometimes when things are not, when circumstances aren't going good and things aren't going good and my life is not going good and my prayers are not being answered the way I think they should be, then we have trouble really, really, really deep down saying God is good. <coughs> but until you're convinced of that, I believe it's hard to see what God's trying to teach us through Him answering our prayers. So if we're convinced of that, in fact, I want to give you this scripture. I'm going to read this to you in James chapter 1. And, and you've heard this before probably. You're convinced that God is good. That's right. In James 1.17 it says, Every, not some, not a few, but every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights which, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, God doesn't change. He's always wanting to do good. He's always wanting good for you. Now, what looks good to you may not be the best for you. And so God is good, and we have to trust that. Of his own, he brought us forth by the word of the truth that we might be a kind of first fruit in his create creatures. So in other words, if God is good enough to send his son to die for you, to, 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 to die on the cross for you and raise from the dead for you and save you, isn't God good enough? Isn't that enough? If we're convinced that God is good, then we have to live and see and think all the time that God is good. And, and this is where the rest of Scripture comes in. In verse 7 and 8, look at that with me. Verse 7 and 8. Remember we talked about ask and seek and knock? Now, now here's Jesus saying this, not me. Jesus is saying this. Ask, now, now look at the verbiage here, please. Ask and it will, say will. It will be given to you. Seek and you will find. And it will and knock and the door will be open to you. It says will, will, will. It doesn't say maybe, it doesn't say could be. It says it will be. That doesn't make any sense. I've asked God for a lot of things. I've sought God in a lot of things. I've, I've knocked on the door. Well, maybe it's because I, it was me and not God. You 
In verse 8, he says, For everyone, everyone, not some, but everyone, everyone who belongs to God, who asks, receives, he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Folks, that's not just Scripture. That's a promise from Jesus. Now, I know some of you have questions here. I'm just saying that God works all this out somehow, some way, and in the end, God's, Jesus says it will happen. And then he gives an illustration here. Look at verse 9 and 10. We've got to keep moving. So he, he says this so, so that he can help you understand. He says, Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, you give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? In other words, and he's, when he talks about a man, then he says a son. So he's talking about a father, your, your earthly father. And he's talking about a, 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 a loving, caring father. Now, I know some people d did not or do not have a loving, caring father, but that's what Jesus is saying here. What, 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 which of you children who have a loving, caring father, which, which one of you men would give your children something basically to harm them? Jamie, would you give your children something to harm them on purpose? Never do that intentionally, would you? Phil, would you do that? You'd never do anything. Give your children something to harm them. Now, your children may say, you're the meanest person on the face of this earth. I can't believe you did that. You're not letting me go there. You're not letting me do that. You're not going to give me the iPhone latest, greatest thing. I hate you. Sometimes that happens. But you know that you have to, okay, we're hitting a nerve here, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it's the text. I'm just preaching it, okay? <laughs> I didn't know you was going to be sitting front and center, <laughs> no, but hey. But I know you're getting old enough and mature enough. You're starting to see that mom and dad are wiser than what they seemed to be a few years ago. And if not, you'll be there soon. Unfortunately, right. But that's a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? Dad wasn't as dumb as I thought he was. He wasn't as mean as I thought he was. Why? He's not going to give me a stone if I ask for bread. He's not going to give me a serpent that's going to bite me and kill me. He's going to do his best to do what's right. But here's the deal. And, and here's where it comes in. In verse 11, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So in other words, and that word evil, and I don't know the every translation, I didn't look it up, that that word evil it has to do with our sinful fallen nature is what it means. It doesn't mean that your dad is evil, though some people think that sometimes. It means that even though your dad does the best he can, it's like this. I was thinking this. I don't know why it popped in my head. You know, my children, I always wanted to give them, but I never wanted to give them to the point that they didn't appreciate what they were getting. If they ever showed me a sign that they weren't appreciating what they got, then it was time to stop. Because they were going to appreciate it. Now, they had more than they needed, and probably we did spoil them to a certain extent, but not to the point that they would not appreciate what they had. But my son, when he turned 16 years old, oh, and by the way, your 15-year-old's not here today, Eli, because he had an accident, and so we need to be praying for him. That, we need to be praying for him. He was hit by a clothesline pole right between his eyes and busted open, was at Children's Hospital for several hours, and so be praying for Eli. But he's getting ready to turn 16, isn't he? Oh, he's 14. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. He's getting ready. To, well, he's getting close enough. He's thinking about driving, isn't he? Yes, okay. My son was 15 and getting ready to drive, and I thought I had the perfect gift for my son. I, I, I came up with a it, was a, it was a Ford Taurus that was good shape, good condition, uh, ran perfect, uh, good looking car, and so I bought it for my son, and I thought this would be the perfect car for him to drive whenever he turned 16. And I pull that in, and I'm thinking, man, he's going to be so excited and so happy and so proud. And so I pull in to the driveway, and he looks at that, and he says, I ain't driving that. <laughs> and I thought, well, yes, you are. But there was something within me, and I had a weak moment, and I thought, you know what? I was 16 once, and, and I, he wanted a truck. And so I thought, well, if I can sell this car and come close to buying a truck, and I could, didn't come real close, but I came halfway close, 
I'll just get him a truck because I, I know what it is for a boy to have a truck. So, so I sold the car, perfectly good car. I sold it, had a weak moment, and I bought this truck, and Dad's going to remember this. <laughs> bought this truck, and of course it was an F-150 Ford, and, and we had to put big tires on it and a loud exhaust on it and all this stuff. And, I, 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 and, and there it was, I give it to him. A father wanting to give his son just something cool. And so I gave him this truck, and he, he begins to drive it. And, of course, Dad's still buying the gas for it, me. And, and I couldn't keep gas in that stinking tank. With the loud mufflers, you know how boys like to wrap the mufflers off, you know? And, and with the big tires on it, which cuts the gas mileage in half, he probably got about three miles to the gallon. And I could not keep that gas in that truck. I put him on a limit. I said, this is how much a week I can afford to put in. Well, it didn't last no time. And, and so I knew I'd made a mistake. And so finally, I came to my senses, and finally I said, we can't afford for you to keep this truck. And so my dad bought the truck from him as an act of mercy. He was kind of wanting a truck. Took the big tires off, and I think took the loud exhaust off, and my dad got about 18 miles a gallon out of the truck. <laughs> At least 15, I don't know, something like that. Here's what I'm wanting to say with that. I try to do the best I can to make sure that my kids had the best of what I could give them. I got to turn that into sermon illustration. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So I tried to give my kids the best I can, but here, here's the bottom line. Sometimes even the best of intentions from a father, we can mess up, can't we, Phil? We can make mistakes. But here's what you have to know in your mind. Your heavenly father will never make a mistake. Whatever's going on in your life, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, it's not, it's not God trying to be mean or trying to hurt you or trying to harm you. The bottom line is this. You have to be convinced in your mind that no matter what, all the time God is good. Verse 12, and we're going to just hit on that real close, real quickly. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for, by the, for this the law and the prophets. Do you know that that's the golden rule that everybody pulls out, and they don't use Scripture to quote that. They just say, do unto others as you want them to do unto them. Have you ever heard that before? It's actually scriptural, but usually they don't refer to it as Scripture. But, but what Jesus is saying, you act towards others the way you want them to act towards you. If they take the low road, you take the high road. If they judge you, you don't judge them. Don't worry about it. In fact, you turn around, and what does Jesus or what does Paul say? He says, you do good to them, and by that you heap coals on their head. They don't know how to respond to that. If they're wrong to you, you be right to them, and they don't have any idea what to do. And when you try to take care of them and you're praying that somehow you can do something for them, asking, seeking, and knocking, God will always supply your needs for that. You get the tie? If you're trying to do something to help someone else, somehow, some way, God will help you with that prayer. So as, as the musicians come this morning, I want you to ask yourself a few questions. So by judging from this, judging from this, is there any room for improvement in your life? Is there something right now, you're asking, you're seeking, you're knocking, but is there some room for improvement in your life? Is there, is there any room that God may be speaking to you and saying, well, let's get this shored up, or let's try, to, let's try to think about this, let's make sure you're seeing clearly. Did you notice any area of concern in your life? Don't focus on your prayer, focus on your life. Is there something in me that I need to be sure is right God is much more concerned about your character than he is about answering your prayers at any moment in time. He answers prayer, but he's more concerned about you and what he's doing in your life. And let me ask you this. Are you really ready for God to answer you? Now, you may be able to look at yourself and judging by that, yes, I am. You just keep asking. You just keep seeking. You just keep knocking. But maybe there's an area you're not seeing clearly because you've got a speck in your eye. You've got a plank in your eye. There's some sin in your life and you're not willing to look at it and you need to look at it and you need to get rid of it. And, and until you do that, you're, you're not ready maybe to hear what God has to say to you. 
And you need to confess it. and You need to get that right with God. Maybe it's that you're not living right. There's some area, you're on that roller coaster and, you, and, and it's not a good one. And you need to get off from it. Don't keep doing the same cycle every day. You know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting something different to happen. And it's not going to happen until you step off and say, this is, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Are you thinking correctly? Maybe today in your thoughts, you're thinking, you know what, I, I don't even know if I'm saved. I know, I know I love God and I love Jesus, but I'm not sure if I've ever really been saved. You know, there's no reason why today you can't nail that down and say, I don't have to doubt anymore. Because I know that Jesus wants to answer that prayer and save my soul. And you need to come today and say, I need Jesus in my life. There may be something in your life that you, you're seeing that God's put in your heart and you know and you're just kind of pulsing there and thinking, I gotta get this right. I gotta get off this crazy train, this roller coaster. I, I gotta make sure that I'm living more consistently. I gotta be sure that, that I'm asking and seeking and knocking and, and I, I can hear from God and I can see clearly. And it's really more about me than it is God. If that's you today, get it right. Father, we come to you, Lord. We thank you for just this message, these words that you spoke fresh to me, Lord. I'm so glad, Lord, that you, you love us enough to, to speak to our hearts. And by your Holy Spirit, I pray, God, that you've, you've touched some people's hearts today. That, Lord, there's some areas, Lord, that we all, even me, I'm, I'm not perfect. But God, you are. And Lord, as we ask and seek and knock, help us to be right with you. We may change what we're asking and seeking and knocking once we get the speck, the plank out of our eye. And, and once we start thinking clearly and correctly, and once we start living right, we, not, we may not even ask the same thing. That may be what you're waiting on, God. We thank you, God, that we know that you're good and you do answer prayer. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.